Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. Behavioral Grooves is a podcast where we explore why we do what we do. And today, that exploration is hitting a bit close to home. As many of you know, Tim and I create our show from our offices in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Last week, on May 25th, a white Minneapolis police officer killed George Floyd, an unarmed black man, by holding him down with a knee on his neck for over eight minutes. This was done even after Mr. Floyd pleaded with them that he could not breathe and bystanders shouted at the police to stop, that the police were killing him. This was done while three other officers either helped in holding down Mr. Floyd or stood by watching. Mr. Floyd's death is an unimaginable horror as it was not the result of a split second or hair trigger decision, but a callous calculated effort that lasted more than eight minutes. His killing kicked off a week of protests, which grew darker as the nights went on. Two days after the killing, protesters burned down the 3rd Precinct police station in Minneapolis and looted many local stores. On Friday, rioters burned a Wells Fargo bank, a post office, and many other buildings. In all, as many as 81 buildings have been burned in in Minneapolis, with 25 of them completely destroyed, and 270 businesses have been vandalized since Mr. Floyd's death. This hits home for Tim and me. Tim lives only a few miles away from the epicenter, but has had people racing down the street as they were deterred from the closed freeways by roadblocks, some of them threatening his neighbors with harm. I live only blocks away from where some of the protests occurred and could smell the smoke and tear gas in the air, hear the chants of the protesters, and see the police and National Guard units patrolling up and down my street in the middle of the night as we stood watch to protect the neighborhood. The bank and post office that were burned down were where I do my banking and where I send out my mail. However, the loss of property in no way compares to the loss of human life, specifically Mr. Floyd's, and in no way compares to the hundreds of years of black suppression. These are terrible tragedies on many, many levels. We've decided to talk about this on this podcast because it's personal for us. We've gone through a range of emotions, and we thought that many of you might have been going through the same. There have been similar incidents of outrage and protests in the past. Eric Garner, Michael Brown, just two that come to mind. But this one seems different. And maybe it seems different because we live here and it's so close. But maybe it's different because it was the last straw that finally tipped the scale. So we hope so. We're going to just talk about our emotions and our feelings and see how this goes. So Tim, what, uh, how how did you feel uh, at the beginning of this? And and has that evolved? It has evolved. It's evolved a lot. I I can trace some very specific feelings at first uh, with seeing the video on the local news and my feelings of horror and disgust at what happened and noticing this video play out minute after minute after minute um, was just horrible. But but that changed as I saw the protests uh, evolve uh, with getting people together. And I and I felt like, man, I, I don't want to I felt like I didn't want to go because of the large crowds. And we we're still in the middle of a pandemic and a, and a medical crisis. But I was really grateful for those protests coming out. And then and then that changed again as I saw the rioters mm. and saw after dark, people started, uh, you know, looting buildings and then burning buildings. And there was confusion and dismay and really kind of questioning, like, what the hell is going on with that? And, and that ended up evolving again as a more peaceful strategy started to come back into the forefront. But but that that was changed dramatically, dramatically when I saw President Trump's um, uh, news op, you know, photo op, and I felt very angry. And really, actually, my wife and I looked at each other and said, "Maybe this is the time for insurrection. Maybe yeah. this is the time when we should have some kind of massive demonstrations that that really send a message that this has to stop." Well, I think. For me, it's been up and down. It has been all over the board. But to that last point that you made, we have been – not we, because you and I haven't. And, and you know, straight out fact, we are 50-some-year-old white guys. And, yes. You know, 
we've lived a life of white privilege. I yes. can I can point to the moments in my life when I've absolutely been able to take advantage of just being uh, a white man. Yeah, but but I think that there's this piece of this where you know we the black people have been protesting and talking about this. I go back to Colin Kaepernick and trying to do this peacefully by taking a knee. And nothing has changed. Yeah. And yeah. I think for for myself, that has been this point where you're realizing that you might need to have some insurrection because that's the only way it seems that people are getting taking notice of this and, and that things are potential changes are happening. That's the only way that people feel like their voice has some meaning because the peaceful protests, which I, I fully am in agreement with, and I don't think people should be looting, and I don't think people no, no. should be burning buildings down, but I get it. I get that anger, and I, I'm also to a point where I'm kind of going, if that's the only way, I mean, I feel bad um, that our society has sunk that low, but that could be one of the pieces. Have there been some key milestones for you? Have there been some specific touchstones that you know, triggered specific feelings for you? Yeah, I think uh, across this all, as I said, my emotions have been up, down, all over, kind of in a, in a variety of different places. I think to begin with, I was shocked, angered, dismayed. I saw the video. I saw almost this dis this callous response by this police officer of, you know, people shouting, he can't breathe. And he just stared off into space and I just, it, it was visceral. Right. Yeah. Um, and then it became even, I think more real on Friday night when uh, the riots, um, the burning and the looting hit closer to home where it was blocks away. It was literally five, six, seven blocks away from, from where I live. Now our streets were quiet. I mean, we were watching this happening on, live on on our computers you know through the news media that was going on but i went outside and our blocks were quiet eerily quiet and just that that difference was really an emotional thing it was like i feeling horror and scared and different aspects of it but then i'm looking around going yeah it's it's still quiet here and how do you how do you process that? So. Yeah, the, yeah, the first couple of nights were eerily quiet on our street as well until uh, one of our neighbors saw uh, a couple of days after the riot started uh, a van and two vehicles, two sedans, pull up and go across the street where some construction is going on. And they went to vandalize a big bulldozer, big caterpillar bulldozer. And my neighbor just yelled, hey, what, what are you doing? You yeah. know? Don't don't do that, and 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 these ten guys, ten guys came back with their fists in the air, yelling, "We're going to come back and loot your house tonight." Now they didn't, you know, they yeah. didn't do that. But but man, it certainly put us all on watch, and it took a while because it, it wasn't an immediate reaction for me. My first reaction was protect my property, protect yeah. my wife, right, protect my home. But within a day, I was I realized they were so angry at everything that's going on, that they are just ready to lash out at just anything and anybody, which is a totally normal human experience. You get you get pushed into a corner, you're going to come out swinging. You know, uh, George, George Lowenstein talks about how we seek, uh, in, in very bad situations, we are risk-seeking. Yeah. And, that's, and that's, what, that's what we saw. We saw people who were making very risky decisions about their behavior because they are just backed into a damn corner. Yeah. That backed into a damn corner, I think is really a key component of this. And uh, you, you, we were talking earlier and you were talking about uh, you had a conversation with a person who was talking about how blacks have felt this emotionally for years and whites have only thought about it uh, in a thinking yeah, kind of yeah. perspective. And right. that, he, what he was saying, and, and I'm misquoting this, so correct me, you is that it. when, is that this kind of feels like 
maybe we're getting, we're feeling it emotionally as well. That whites are, are starting to feel it rather than just think about it. Yeah. That we, yeah. that we, yeah, that, the you know, emo- that blacks have felt this for years. Whites just think about it. And maybe now that, that whites are starting to feel it. And, and I, when you said that, I resonated with that because I, I can look back on my own behavior and, and I think about this stuff and I, and I, I, Expose that this is racism is bad. That police brutality against you know people of color is the wrong thing to do. But did I ever really feel it? Did I have it in my gut? I didn't. I I know I didn't. You know, if you look back at you know even Philip Callister Castro. I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce his name. Locally here, that happened just a few years ago. A a black man got shot in his car as he's pulled over for a, a. traffic violation yeah philando and, castile yeah Ken, thank you and i i thought about that i literally uh, was disgusted and dismayed but i don't think i felt it and i'm feeling this one and i think there's been i don't know what it is and maybe it is just because we're in the epicenter of this well but i, I have a different feeling about this part of it across the nation Part of it is that we had a very brave young woman stand there for over eight minutes and record the whole thing on video. Yeah. We, we, you know, she had the guts to stand there and do something that must have, it, when I go, when I go back and look at any part of that video, it still just terrifies me. Uh, And to think she had the, the, the guts to stand there and photograph. And then even while it's happening, she said, Hey, she's calling to the officer saying, stop. Yeah, uh, he's not responding. He's yeah. not breathing. Che- yeah. At least check his pulse. That she had the wherewithal to to do this is uh, is I think is why we have people around the whole world standing up and saying this has got to change. It's it's the video. It's it's the video footage again. Looking at uh, what happened down in Georgia just a few weeks ago with the white men chasing after. Um, you know, somebody and killing them down in, in broad daylight and not getting prosecuted until the video surfaced. I, I'm going to read um, something that our former mayor, R.T. Rybeck, wrote, um, and I thought he just captured this. Um, so he's he's kind of relaying this and he says, quote, a human being staring calmly off in the middle distance while his knee slowly suffocates another human being. Our repulsion should boil over as we realize that the white police officer who took an oath to protect and serve that person on the ground who is black would not have acted so brutally if the man he was restraining were white. That's the key piece is this would not have happened if if it would have been you or me. It, it, we could have been resisting much strong. You know, it, you know, George wasn't even re, re, you know, he wasn't resisting at that point. Right. He was laying face down on the ground, damn ground, completely subdued, arms behind his back, handcuffs Handcuff. on, and, and and to think that he he is completely lifeless in his actions, and yet that officer kept his knee right on his neck, and and. Horrible. And and you and me, that would have never happened to. And I, I, you know, part of this is raising this ire with me, too, because I think, again, many, many people like us, white, have been silent too long. And so, actually, I, I usually don't uh, get on Facebook, Facebook uh, feuds, right? When people post these things up on Facebook, whether it's politics or whatever, I just, I've realized I'm not going to change their mind is why am I even trying to do this? It just causes me angst. And so I'm not going to do it. And yet I, I, I had a old work acquaintance who posted something about white privilege and, and the fact that white privilege is that that's, there's no such thing really just because you're white, you don't have privilege. And, and I just responded back and said, no, that's that's not the case. Do you think we would have, you know, had the same situation? It's just because of the color of his skin that he was treated this way. And yeah. there's a variety of other aspects around that. And then I had another woman right back uh, who I don't know based on that. And she said, well, if it would have been a white, big, large white man who was high and counterfeiting and using all of, again, these like trying to lay the blame back on the George victim. Floyd because he was big and he might have been, you know, uh, drinking or, or whatever. And he was, you know, trying to pass a counterfeit bill. Um, 
And I sit there and go, I don't care. No, if he would have been white, if he would have been anything except for a person of color, th- that would have never happened. Right. That would not have happened. And even if the the people, as you said, the, the woman who was videotaping and the aunt bystanders who are yelling at the police, if they would have been white, I wonder if that would have had a difference too. But because they're not, because they are black, they're people of color, there's a certain, you know, In- indignation. Racism. Yeah, indignation yeah. that just doesn't yeah. happen. And that's the piece that I think is really disheartening about all of this is that it's 2020 that this is still going on that even seeing the video evidence of this there are people out there who are trying to throw justify not justify it but rationalize a way that this was just a few bad actors yeah that this isn't a systematic thing that you know it's not white privilege it's not this you know, current aspect of, you know, the society that we live in, that is just these four people. And yeah, they did a bad thing, but the rest of the society isn't as bad as everybody's making it out to be. Yeah. It it pisses me off that we're 150 years after the 13th and 14th Amendment, which in the United States was amendments to the Constitution to abolish slavery and grant um, African-Americans the ability to vote. And we're 50 years plus after the civil rights the man just says that you you can't discriminate against anyone for color, you know, race or creed, uh, and and we're fifty years beyond that, and we are still in a situation where where accounting for uh, for education, we still have a twenty five percent pay gap between whites and blacks. Mm. That that white men earn twenty five percent more than black men with the same educational background and same experience. Black men are two and a half times more likely to be killed by a police officer than a white person. Two and a half times. I let that sink in. So is there? <laughs> Is there any hope? I, I think there has to be. Otherwise, why get up in the morning? Yeah, we have to. Ha- we have to have hope. But I, but I know damn well that I can't do what I've been doing. I both both. I know that you know both of us have been involved in charitable organizations, pro social yeah. organizations, a, a lot in our lives. Yeah. But I really need to refocus on social justice at this point. Yeah, I think I think it's a big thing. I, so here's here's where my hope comes from. So Friday night we had the the fires, we had the looting that were going on relatively close to my neighborhood. Saturday afternoon we got a call. Uh, we met with probably over two hundred people from Whittier neighborhood in a local park. And we were gathering together and putting together this idea of we need to we need to come together to look out and to care for each other and, and to protect our neighborhood. And so we set up these, you know, uh, by street and then by block. And I became a block lead. And so that night we set up, you know, I'm going to take curfew went in from, you know, 8, 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. And so we took two hour shifts and so we had these shifts and people were out on their porches and kind of walking down the street and making sure that people are safe and, you know, looking to see if there's suspicious activity going on. Uh, and we came together and we came together as this group. And the other piece is Saturday after Saturday, actually during the day, I'm, I, I wake up and I look out the window and there's people walking down the street with brooms and dustpans and buckets and they're going to clean up. I took my kids down. We, we rode our bikes down to 38th and Chicago where, where George, George Floyd had been murdered. And there's this big memorial with all these flowers and, and there's a, you know, it was cordoned off and, uh, there were people on speakers and they're having people talk. And it was just an emotional gathering that was reflecting on this man's life but also on the impact that it has. And it was very peaceful, uh, very, you know, hopeful from a perspective of as many people, I mean, there was as many white people there as there were people of color. 
And, um, you know, it was good for my kids to see. And I, I have to wonder how my kids are going to take this. You know, you actually just brought up something that is reason for me to have hope. And that is more white people involved in the protests. Yeah. That it's not, this is not a black problem. This is a white problem. This is a white problem that has to be solved by white people. This is not a problem that black people have to solve. They are the victims. They are the result of all this. And we have an opportunity as white people to make a difference. Yeah. But it's but it's up to us. It's not this is not call your favorite black friend and ask them what to do. That is <laughs> not a good way to deal with this. This is an opportunity to put on your big boy pants and figure out how to engage and do something different in, in the world to, to level, level the playing field. Yeah. And, and that's all I think they're asking for is a level playing field saying, look, if we're going to run a race, let's make sure we start at the same starting line and that you don't have a head start. That's, let's make sure that the treatment that we get under the law is equal treatment, that we are treated the same as you would be treated. If I'm doing something wrong, yes, you know, arrest me, do whatever it is, but don't do that just because the color of my skin. Yeah. And make sure that we have equal treatment. Yeah. I, 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 a vivid image for me was a local reporter walking with a bunch of protesters after curfew. So, they're kind of in the danger zone, but this is a group of peaceful protesters and they're mostly kids. They're mostly uh, teenagers, early twenties, uh, and, and they're all black in this particular situation. And, and they're kind of reveling in the fact that it's after curfew and a couple of them are just kind of almost dancing like, yeah, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're rebelling. We're different. We're, you know, we're defying the law. And then one of the kids grabs the microphone and says, Hey, if you're out making violent activities or causing arson, you're stupid. Yeah. Just stop that. And then he follows it up with, with the thing that really hit me. And he said, I just want to be able to be in a white neighborhood and not be accused of something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> oh I my. mean, think about the, so for me, I think what's really hit is that, you know, for a few days, there was some fear of, of what was going to happen. Um, and, and I had to stop myself to feeling sorry for myself because I'm going, there's, and it's different, but this is the fear that, you know, black people live with, uh, much more frequently than I do. Yeah. Right. All, all the time. Yeah. All the time. Not just, I, I not get, just every now and then. Yeah. Getting pulled over by a police officer by me. I, I am, I, you know, I might get a ticket, but that's going to be the worst of it, right? Yeah. That is by far going to be the worst of it. I don't have to worry that I'm going to get pulled out, thrown to the ground, um, handcuffed and, you know, taken into custody or, or worse. Uh, my kids don't have to worry about that. We had a really powerful conversation with our kids about white privilege. This idea that, you know, we don't have to worry about these things that, hey, even if I passed a, a counterfeit $20 bill and the police came, and even if I was, you know, uh, didn't want to get into the police car and, and I resisted, I would still be alive today. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And, and that's just facts. Those are nobody would, uh, yeah, I, I would be crazy if I thought otherwise. So there's a video of that was made by a group of people who are were trying to demonstrate the difference between the way blacks are treated by the law and whites are treated by the law. And so they had, um, I think it was a 17 or 18 year old young white man with a rifle over his shoulder, walking through a white neighborhood, and a cop comes up to him, kind of casually, and just said, "Hey, what what's going on?" And the, the kid says, officer, I'm just here to, to demonstrate my Second Amendment rights to bear arms. And the officer goes, well, okay, everything all right? And the kid said, everything's fine. And, and the officer moves on. And then they show a black kid, the same age, with the same rifle over his shoulder, 
walking through a black neighborhood. And there is, first of all, you see him just walking down the street completely alone, no one else on the on the sidewalk. And then all of a sudden, three police cars arrive in a, in a very coordinated effort. They get out and yell at him, put the weapon down, lay on the ground, flat, arms out, uh, and they they arrest him. They put him in handcuffs without asking, are you just exercising your Second Amendment rights? No, not at all. He was completed, treated completely differently. Yeah. And that's and- because of the color of his skin, not because of anything else. Yeah. And that's the fact that we have to come to grips with. It's it's us as a uh, white society. We have to be the ones who change. As you said before, it's it's not a black problem. They're the victims in this. It is a white problem. And and as much as we can go, well, whites are mistreated as well. And there's a lot of things going on with that, which are some of the arguments I'm hearing is, yes. Which, which may be true. It's, which it, which it are is, true. It is true. But they don't negate this. They don't negate this. And they're not because of the color of our skin. They are because of other factors. Mm-hmm. And those factors are important as well. Poverty, lack of education, a number of other factors that go into this that are that are systematic or systemic and, you know, impact our lives. But this one is, you know, as you said, 150 years since 13th and 14th Amendments, 50 years since the Civil Rights Act. And this is still going on. And, you know, I. I'm hopeful. I, I don't know if this is just because we're here in the epicenter, uh, but I get a different feel from this. I get a different take that I'm I'm hopeful that there will be real and lasting change, that these protests will lead to laws and regulations, that they will lead to increased understanding and effort by people that look like you and me to try to understand where our own biases are, uh, and and the fact that we cannot remain silent anymore. This idea that we have to go out and do more um, for this, you know, I've I've seen the outpouring of the community around here, which has been amazing. We talked about people going up and helping cleaning up uh, after the looting and, and the riots. We've talked about uh, there's been pop up food shelves uh, in my neighborhood at my my kids' school pop up food shelf this week that has been just amazing. There's uh, rooms full of food and people are coming that have been affected by this and the coronavirus. This idea, my my wife wa- worked with some other people in the community. They set up a GoFundMe site for people who have been impacted. Uh, and in the past three days, it's raised over $30,000 um, to help people pay their rent or to get back on their feet, um, both from the 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 civil unrest that was going on as well as the coronavirus. I think this idea of pulling together this idea of social bonds, which is really hard now because we're in the middle of a pandemic and we usually can't. And there's that aspect of this too, but we see it. We see people gathering together. We see the protests that are going on, not just here, but in Washington, DC, New York, LA, all across small towns across America, not only just in America, but in Amsterdam and around the world. This is captured the attention and I hopeful, I'm hopeful that it will make a difference. I, I'm you know, but it, I'm only hopeful in, in as much as that we have to take action. And it can't just be us thinking about it. We have to be feeling it. <laughs>